Welcome to Vigorous Training. I'm Coach Steve. Let's talk about cardio and which form of cardio is best to prevent muscular atrophy, especially when you're doing cardio for longer periods of time or high amounts of cardio, where you're trying to get lean, especially into the single digits. And what a lot of people already noticed, I'm sure you've gone through several diets yourself if you're watching this YouTube channel, is that at one point your legs or your back or your chest or whatever body part that's a weaker body part is going to flatten out. And the choice of cardio equipment that you decide to use is going to exacerbate that. It's going to flatten it out more and maybe even dig into that precious muscle tissue that you've built during the off season and burn that away. And now your muscle is actually smaller and weaker than where you were at the end of the off season. And that's something we're trying to prevent here. In this video, we're not going to go into what is the best time to perform cardio. Everybody knows that sex before bed is the best time to do cardio. And then the second best is fasted upon waking and the third best is right after a workout and every other time you do cardio it's not going to be as beneficial especially if you do it right after meals because now you're burning away all the food that you ate so case closed sex before bed first fasted upon waking second and directly post-workout those are the three opportunities you can do cardio for fat loss and you know the first opportunity you probably don't want to do for fat loss because you need a little bit of a stamina and the last thing you want to do is you know go hypoglycemic right before you're uh, about to finish again different story and we're not going to go into that in this video we're going to go into which piece of cardio equipment you can use to prevent atrophy of a certain body part now if you've built your legs during the off season and you went from an average body part to a strong body part and your legs are very very developed you can basically choose any piece of cardio equipment you like to use because almost all cardio equipment really use legs heavily. So whether that's the recumbent bike or the stationary bike or the treadmill or the elliptical machine, if you've got very strong and developed legs, it doesn't really matter which piece of cardio equipment you like to use. You can just do whatever cardio you like to do. If you don't like to do cardio, you're still going to have to do it. There's no ways around it. Cardio equals fat loss and without cardio, your fat loss is not going to be that pronounced. Plus, cardio contributes to metabolism and heart and cardiovascular health, so there's no real way around it. If you don't like cardio, you're still going to have to do it 20 to 30 minutes per day, preferably upon waking or before bed. But again, that's a different kind of cardio. So the upon waking one is the one you're going to have to perform consistently for metabolic rate and cardiovascular health, whether that's during your off-season or a cutting phase. And of course, during a cutting phase, your caloric intake is going to be lower, resulting in fat loss. Okay, so you got strong legs, it doesn't matter. But if legs are a weak body part for you and you need to preserve them during a cutting phase, you really have to be selective. And depending on how you build biomechanically, the treadmill might be suitable for you or the elliptical might be suitable for you. So I have a treadmill here at home. And I noticed that when I have a 0% incline, I use a little bit more legs or a little bit more quads than when I do 3% incline, where the weight shifts mostly to my calves and hamstrings. Now, there's a little bit of a sweet spot with the treadmill. Between 3 and 6%, I'm mostly walking on my calves and hamstrings. But if I go from 6 to 9, maybe 12 or even 15, I switch back to quads again because the incline is so high that it's basically turned into a Stairmaster. So that's what I do infrequently, maybe twice a week. Normally, I walk on 3% incline at 4.5 to 5 kilometers per hour, which is a nice steady pace. Increases my heart rate to about 110. You know, I'm using the Bivolol, so my heart rate is a little bit lower than normal. But if you're not using the Bivolol and you're using fat burners, of course, a 3% incline at 4.5 to 5 kilometers per hour is going to increase your heart rate a little bit more than in my case. So again, everybody's a little bit different. So if I walk straight, quads, 3 to 6% incline calves and hamstrings. And then anything over 6% incline, it almost turns into a Stairmaster. I'm walking on my glutes and my quads again. So I'm spacing those two sessions that I have on a high incline treadmill away from my quad workout so it doesn't interfere. So let's say I do my quads on Monday. Then Wednesday, I do a high incline treadmill session and Friday. And then I have two days before the next quad workout. So it doesn't interfere that much. And you get a little bit of a different variation. Ideally, I'd walk between 3 to 6% incline on the treadmill every day. But what I noticed is that if I do a high incline treadmill or use an actual Stairmaster twice a week, the quality of my quad workouts actually improves because I'm increasing my VO2 max and I increase the recovery, you know, by increasing blood flow after the workout. So you do quads, take one day rest, 
you get a little bit of active recovery from this high incline treadmill or stairmaster and then again two days later which doesn't interfere with your quad workout the next week because you have two days of recovery from this you know high incline treadmill cardio work that you're doing so i found this the best approach to preserve my legs but maybe after four weeks to six weeks on the steady treadmill protocol I noticed that my quads get a little bit tired and fatigued and I noticed that my workouts are declining. So usually around six weeks, eight weeks, I need to schedule a deload anyway. And you can do a deload with cardio as well. You just take a week or two off and then you replace the cardio with a fat burner like clenbuterol ephedrine, which actively burns fat. And something like yohimbine, you would need to take before cardio, right? So if you're stopping to do cardio, you should stop the yohimbine. And growth hormone, even though it causes lipolysis, it doesn't actively burn fat unless you're doing cardio right after the injection. So during the time that you're taking one or two weeks off, you can also stop the fat burners with only release fat, but don't actively burn them unless you're doing activity. So that's the growth hormone, the Yohimba and the GW1516, the SR9009s. Those promote fat loss when you're doing activity, but not when you're sedentary. And that's where the clenbuterol and the ephedrine comes into place. DNP, I'm not really a big fan, but it does burn fat when you're not doing anything. Again, don't do DMP because it's a horrible compound. If you're taking a break from actively doing cardio to give your lower body a break, clenbuterol and ephedrine are sufficient to increase your metabolic rate or keep it around the same level. And whereas cardio would increase metabolic rate depending on the duration and the intensity, clenbuterol and ephedrine do that in a dose dependent fashion. And of course your caloric intake contributes to that. So you'll have to assess how much cardio you were doing and how much you want to replace that with clenbuterol for one or two weeks. And then when your legs have recovered 100%, you phase out the ephedrine or the clenbuterol, you go back to your favorite cardio machine and continue with the same intensity and the same duration you were doing before to pick up the pace and continue with your fat loss journey. Now you don't want to run both at the same time from the beginning because when you go from 15% to 8%, on a ton of cardio and a ton of fat burners and you're still going to experience atrophy of weaker body parts because you've overdone the fat burners to get down to eight percent body fat and now you have no pharmacology to play with to go from eight percent to six percent or maybe even four percent if you're doing a contest prep and you're planning to step on stage so again please keep those active fat burners like clenbuterol or ephedrine for the final stages of your diet and only use lipolytic agents consistently, which are compounds that don't actively burn fat by themselves, but instead just release stored body fat into the bloodstream, which you can then burn away through activity like cardio or exercise. So those are growth hormone, yohimbine, rovulcine, or anabolic steroids, which block the corticosteroid receptor on adipose tissue, which results in a little bit of fat loss as well. Off the top of my head, it's going to be Anivar, Trembolone, Halotestin, which of course are all very popular during the cutting phase. Those compounds block the corticosteroid receptors with different levels of affinity, and depending on the dose, the duration, and their affinity, they will result in a significant amount of fat loss, especially when you're doing caloric restriction and combine that with other lipolytic agents. So let's bring it back to the cardio because we've got a little bit of off topic here, but it's still very relevant information when you're trying to achieve the most amount of fat loss while preserving weaker body parts. The treadmill, depending on the incline, is going to preserve your legs the most. And then the second option you have is the elliptical machine, which is almost the same as the treadmill. But with the elliptical, you remove the small impact that you have on the treadmill, which transfers a little bit of energy and causes some quad activation which you don't get with the elliptical machine. And the good thing about the elliptical machine is, is that you can use the handles to transfer a little bit of energy to your arms and back. So if you have a strong back, like I do, and weaker legs, either the treadmill on 3% to 6% incline, or any level of intensity on the elliptical machine, because now you're transferring the fat burning load to other parts of the body, and instead of doing half body cardio on the treadmill, the recumbent bike or the stationary bike, now you're doing full body cardio, which takes the pressure off your legs and preserves them for a longer period of time, even when you're in a severe caloric deficit. And what you'll notice is because the elliptical machine is a full body exercise, that your heart rate will be a little bit higher. So now it's easier to get into the fat burning zone of let's say 125 beats per minute to 135 beats per minute, but your intensity is less compared to that same fat burning zone range on the lower body cardio machines. So now you not only transferred the fat burning load, the intensity is less, 
which significantly decreases atrophy of the lower body, if atrophy happens at all. So if you want to keep all the precious leg mass that you've built during the off-season when you transition into a cutting phase, especially during the later stages of a cutting phase or contest prep, hands down, the best piece of cardio equipment you can choose is the elliptical machine. But if you've got a weaker upper body, especially if you have a weaker back, I would definitely avoid the elliptical machine or the rowing machine for that matter, because that's 100% back and posterior chain recruitment. Does anybody use a rowing machine anymore? Let me know in the comment fields if you're uh, still doing the rowing machine for cardio. I haven't seen anybody do that machine in, I don't know, forever. The elliptical, yes. The treadmill, yes. The recumbent bike, yes. So let's get into swimming a little bit, which is my second favorite method to perform cardio. I'm sure you can figure out the first favorite. So when you have access to a pool in your condominium or you're uh, one of those rich guys who's got a 25 meter pool in his backyard, if you've got access to a pool, relatively close by so you don't have to take the car or the bicycle or whatever transportation you prefer to use to a place where you can swim if you've got it close by you can do that upon waking you wake up you have your coffee you go swim it's a full body cardio exercise your heart rate will be reasonably high similar to the elliptical machine and then all you need to do is prevent yourself from sinking because a bodybuilder body isn't very um, hydrodynamic. It's not aerodynamic, but it's hydrodynamic. And I've noticed that with myself. I used to go swimming all the time. I swam from maybe three years old to 15 years old. And then I started going to the gym. So I would still swim up until I was 18 years old. But the bigger I got, and you know, when I say bigger, this is like minuscule amount of muscle you could have drug free when you're 18 with average genetics. So as I progressed in muscularity, my swimming capacity went down. And I noticed that now, especially that I'm over 100 kilos, sometimes even 115 kilos, I get into the pool, I start to paddle, <laughs> but my body doesn't move. It stays stationary because it's too blocky and not hydrodynamic at all. So if you have a small pool, you can still get away. Let's say you have a 15 meter, meter pool and some of the condominiums have like a small pool. It's not really meant to do laps, but it's uh, long enough for a bodybuilder just to casually paddle along, get your heart rate up and, and do full body cardio. Now with swimming, you'll notice a lot of recruitment of the lats and the adductors. And I honestly think because I swam so long for 12 to 15 years before I really started getting into bodybuilding, is that you create some sort of epigenetics where those body parts that you recruit with some sort of endurance work in your earlier years results in more muscle mass when you start to develop that with bodybuilding. So I have uh, very big lats and, and very well-developed adductors. And what I see with people that did long distance running or track and field or sprinting is that their legs are very, very developed once they start bodybuilding. They really round out, they get very nice and separated, very detailed. And the guys that did some sort of contact sport, like boxing, for example, they get very nice shoulder width and a big thick chest and, and big triceps because they've been throwing a lot of punches and the bench press is not very far off from that. So I honestly think you can create some sort of epigenetics for yourself by following an endurance-based sport in your younger years. Now, it's, of course, difficult to predict that you're going to turn into a bodybuilder later on in life. And I think most of the parents would definitely advise against it. So whatever sport of choice you did when you were younger, whether that's swimming or tennis or football, I think it's going to transition over into your bodybuilding later on in life. And whatever muscle you created epigenetic for, those are never going to go away. Whether you're in severe caloric restriction, performing high amounts of cardio, those are going to be your stronger body parts. So let's say you do a sprinting or football or um, you know track and field, your lower body is going to be more developed. When you do swimming, from personal experience, I can say your lats and your adductors are going to be more developed. And when you do a contact sport, which I've seen with some of my clients that used to do contact sports in the beginning, your upper body is going to be more developed. And then depending on which body part is more developed and which ones tend to atrophy when you do cardio, you're going to apply a particular strategy to minimize or prevent atrophy of a certain body part. And whether that's the inclusion of BCAs during your cardio session or using particular fat burners or perhaps by using a little bit of insulin to prevent atrophy by increasing nutrient uptake during your cardio session. There's many different strategies you can use or a combination of strategies to prevent atrophy of particular body parts. 
I really hope this video was helpful and gave you some ideas on how to preserve that precious muscle tissue that you build during your off season when you transition into a cutting phase in order to get shredded AF. If you made it to the end of the video, please leave me a like on your way out. And if you're not subscribed, now would be a good time to do so. If you're looking for the best bodybuilding ebook on the planet, head over to vigorousteve.com slash shop. You can find the link in the description. I got four ebooks published so far, and I'm spending all my free hours writing day and night to publish more high quality ebooks for you guys in the near future. Everything you need to know about bodybuilding pharmacology is right there. And I'm going to focus on organ health and nutrition a little bit later. So that's phase one, bodybuilding pharmacology. Phase two is organ health and phase three is nutrition. I already posted a ton of articles on vigorousteve.com, which you can read 100% for free. If you'd like to get some personalized advice, please consider using one of my services, whether that's the personalized advice by email service, one hour consultations or coaching. You can find all the rates on my website as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.